In a healthy patient, I've had success really with about a seven day latency period. Rarely will I go shorter than that. Occasionally I go up to 10 if I feel uh, like the patient needs the extra little bit of healing. Um, and that's both in the tibia and the femur. Um, I, I get too anxious and I like to see the, the nail move. I wanna make sure everything is working the next time that I see them in clinic. And so the, that I think pushes me to a, maybe a slightly shorter latency period than what's been described. I haven't had any issues with it just yet. As far as initial rate in the tibia, I've been going about 0.25 millimeters three times a day um, at the, to start, and the femur is usually about the same, and I'll speed up as I need to. If I'm worried that the patient may have some biology issues or maybe not the healthiest uh, patient, I'll go even slower than that and potentially even do 0.2 millimeters three times a day or even 0.25 millimeters twice a day. But I like to break it up two to three sessions um, if I can, if I think the patient will be compliant and will tolerate it. So for latency and rhythm, I think a lot of different people that I've talked to all have a different prescription for this. So personally, what I, what I do, and this was given to me by Dr. Green, Stuart Green, when I first started this, was uh, a latency period of 10 to 14 days. And then I start with uh, a transport in the tibia of 0.75 millimeters a day, and I divide that all into quarter millimeter increments. Uh, and in the femur, uh, one millimeter a day. Now, I adjust that as I go, and that's the main reason why I see a patient every two weeks. And what I found, the younger, healthier patients, um, I don't think it's better if you transport them faster. I think it's almost necessary. Uh, I've had one or two patients pre-consolidate that were younger, young, healthy, active uh, patients, and they just, they grow bone quicker. So um, with a younger patient, you know, late teens, early 20s, I'll, I'll tend to start them a little bit quicker uh, than I will an older patient. Um, I will also uh, think about, not necessarily do this, but think about adjusting my latency period for the fear that they may pre-consolidate before that latency period is over. So my docking procedure begins before the patient has even docked. When they get close, and by close I mean 15 to, you know, 10 to 15 millimeters, then I know about what date they should be docking as long as everything is going fine. And at that point in time, I'll schedule them for surgery at, at that point so that our surgery is gonna take place right before they dock. We'll go to the operating room, we will open up the docking site and we'll clean out all the scar tissue and all the fibrous tissue that is formed between the two docking segments. We'll deposit some bone graft, allograft, but more importantly, I wanna get some further compression of the docking site once the scar tissue has been debrided. That can be either by driving the precise nail forward a little bit more, or just with some uh, large point of reduction clamps. I like to make sure that that transporting segment is stabilized in some way, and that can either be a mini fragment plate across the docking site, a continuous compression staple across the docking site, or even putting an extra intramedullary or an extra in interlocking screw through the nail into the uh, transporting segment itself to make sure that it doesn't spring up and, and, uh, and bounce back and, and lose some of the transport that you've already had. Once the docking site has been prepped and the docking site is compressed, at that point in the same setting, I'll take out the precise nail and I'll put in a new trauma nail. And I think that Pushing the trauma nail through the regenerate, and again, I don't ream the regenerate, but just the, the, the mechanics of just inserting and, and, uh, and taking out the precise nail, I think helps spark up that regenerate. I think reaming the docking site also helps and helps deposit some autograft around the docking site as well. Uh, and at that point in time, the trauma nail goes in and we'll put in uh, completely new interlocking screws. Post-operatively, I usually let them stabilize and let their wounds heal before we even consider weight bearing. And for me, I like to see the regenerate mature just a little bit more before I let them start to weight bear. This is typically anywhere from four to six weeks. Um, but again, I want them to be aggressive with their range of motion uh, in their ankle and their knee. Um, but I think that at that point in time, once the regenerate matures, again, the regenerate and docking set are spanned by a stainless steel plate as well as a titanium rod. Uh, I think that that is biomechanically strong enough to allow, to allow full weight bearing at that point.
my docking protocol, um, there's a couple of different situations. So if I'm docking into a metaphysist uh, in a healthy patient, so a lot of times I won't do a procedure. So if I can have a diaphyseal portion of the bone uh, that's smaller diameter than the metaphysis that I'm docking into, I found that that running that diaphysis down into the metaphysis and instead of getting end-on-end -end healing, getting side-to-side -side healing uh, is, is very uh, successful in doing that. So I've had a couple of patients where I haven't had to do a docking procedure. Um, in somebody with a diaphyseal docking, uh, that's gonna be a lot uh, less forgiving. So those patients, to me, always need a docking procedure. So when I take a, a, a patient back with a diaphyseal docking procedure, I can use the Fast Distractor Max to open up their fracture. Um, I can do my uh, debridement, and so I'll scrape around the ends of the bone, take out any soft tissue that might be uh, interposed, uh, try to get to good bleeding bone, then run it back down to compress it, um, and then at that point, it's important to hold it. So I've discovered the hard way um, what uh, rebound is in these situations where I wasn't quite aware of that. Um, so you need to put something in in that uh, moment to hold that docking site together. Um, I'll use a small five hole plate and I'll put two holes on either side with the hole in the middle at the docking site. Um, and then I like to actually uh, debris around uh, the bone. So like do kind of a decortication uh, around uh, the docking site. Um, I've also used a drill to drill small holes and to get good bleeding bone. Um, and then I, I'll, I'll usually pack a, a synthetic bone graft around that. Um, once I've done that, then I'll take, take the nail out. Uh, the, I'll take the precise nail out and put uh, a new trauma nail in uh, and then let the patient weight bear immediately. So bone grafting for the docking site, uh, typically it can't sell as chips. Um, it seems, I seem to have success just using allograft, and that seems to work. Um, I think more importantly, or equally as important, is getting some compression of the docking site acutely in the operating room, either by driving the precise nail a little bit more, or getting some compression with the clamp in the operating room. In my docking procedures, um, any supplement that I use, I think the most effective is gonna be an autograft. So I'll, I'll take cancellous bone most, most of the time from Iliac Crest. Um, in other situations where I don't necessarily want to use an autograft, I'll use uh, an allograft uh, from a cadaver. My compression protocol, and this has evolved from the beginning. At the beginning, I would uh, compress until I saw a little bit of bend in the screw. But now, uh, with the idea of getting the patient mobilized as quickly as possible, which is what most people want, um, I've put uh, a continuous compression device in, so a staple that, that holds uh, the compression uh, and then converted to a nail or a plate in compression mode. So really, I'm running my, my transport until the bones are compressed or touching uh, and then putting a plate on. Now, if I was doing a non-union, my compression protocol, and this goes back to my early paps with uh, compressing these would be uh, 0.25 millimeters once a week. I typically don't do a compression protocol for these in cases where I am doing a docking site uh, procedure. In the case where I'm unable to do a docking site procedure because of soft tissue concerns, then I will try to compress as much as I think that the, that the nail will tolerate. And in that case, it's usually just trying to over compress a couple millimeters um, over the span of a couple weeks. So during the PAPS procedure itself, these implants are not made for weight bearing. And so I'm fine with a foot flat or toe touch weight bearing just to you know, let their foot feel the weight of, of themselves just on the floor a little bit, but I don't want them walking on it. I don't really want them weight bearing on it. Once the docking site procedure is done and the precise nail is out and the trauma nail goes back in, then at that point, I usually give them about three to four weeks before I'm, I'm comfortable letting them weight bear. I wanna see the regenerate mature just a little bit more because that nail is still doing a lot of work. My weight bearing protocol uh, during a uh, past is non-weight bearing. Um, the anti-grade transports can start bearing weight as tolerated once they reach docking. It's very important for a retrograde transport to, 
to remain non-weight bearing um, once they dock. Um, however, uh, with these patients, once they dock, I'm taking them to the operating room, removing their hardware, uh, and replacing the precise nail with a normal trauma nail to allow them to start weight bearing as tolerated at that point. So for my PAPS patients, the initial follow-up is gonna be weekly. I wanna make sure that they are transporting as much as I think they should be based on the rate that we have selected for them. I wanna make sure that they are doing okay and that their pain is controlled and that they're able to manage the external remote control and everything that comes on with you know, a bad trauma that they have. I'm getting x-rays every time they come in. I wanna look at the quality of the regenerate and how much they have transported. Um, once they have shown that they're doing okay and that they're just smooth sailing, usually every other week will suffice um, and, and I'm comfortable with that. There are some patients that prefer to see me every week. They just need the reassurance and that's fine by me. But typically, at least to start, it's weekly until I know that, that everything is looking good.